So welcome everyone. Welcome back to this Restore US Learning Core conversation. Um, we've got a great session, great guests today. Carlos Rodriguez is joining us. Um, but just a note about how our time's gonna work today. In the past, we've only had an hour together where we dive in with the great guest speaker and then we run out of time to process as a community. So Carlos is gonna join us for the first hour. We'll say goodbye to him and the recording at two, and then we'll have 15, 20 minutes to connect and process as a community. Um, Cause I'm sure we'll all have a lot of thoughts that come up as we go through this next hour together. Let me quickly get the Zoom set up and then we'll dive right in. Yeah. So why Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico is a topic that might have come out of left field for some of you when we think about Restore US, why we're talking about these issues. Um, but it's one that I think is really important and I hope you all will leave today thinking it's really important and tied into everything we've been talking about. So Puerto Rico is a US territory, which means that Puerto Ricans pay taxes to the US, they're US citizens and they can travel on US passports but they don't have elected voting officials in Congress, nor can they vote in US presidential elections. And despite having a climate lush with growing potential, produce on the island is much more expensive than any, in many places in the US. And there's so much we can dive into here, Carlos. We'll get into a lot of it. Um, and we'll also share some links for further reading because we can't cover everything in an hour together, but it should be a great conversation. So Carlos, to introduce you now, welcome. Um, Carlos is a passionate speaker who leads the Happy Nonprofit and the Happy Givers. We met him at Telos through our most recent Pastors and Peacemakers cohort. So he has gone through a lot with us. He's been on both trips, knows the principles and practices, um, I think understands what we're trying to do really well. And all of the work he does is in alignment with what we're trying to do. So super excited to have you today. Thank you. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say to introduce yourself before we dive in. Well, my full name is actually Carlos Alberto Rodriguez Sostre Ortiz Rivera Pagan Burgo Pardo Garcia Caquia Nazario. Um, but I expect no one to remember that because uh, my wife of 19 years now still doesn't know my full name. So you're all off the hook. Um, Carlos is good enough. Uh, but it is a super long name because my dad comes from an area in the south of Puerto Rico where you basically were carrying our... Um, our family history with us, right? So Carlos Alberto, my first name, which is the same as my as my dad. And of course, I have two boys and they're both named Carlos first name. It's like George Foreman, one, two, three, four, five. We do that version here. Uh, but then Rodriguez and Sostre. Rodriguez is my dad's first last name. Sostre is my mom's first last name. And then you basically keep going um, and you trace back as long as you can. Um, and it's a way to do, what's that called? Ancestry.com and 23andMe, those it's 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 the Puerto Rican version of that um, back in the day. And it works wonders because I was pastoring in Raleigh, North Carolina um, for about 10 years. And one of our interns from our church had one of my last names, Padro. Um, he was actually from his dad was from a similar area that I that my dad was from. Come to find out we're second cousins. So it's a wonderful system. And I hope you you all learn how to do it yourselves. That's great. Um, I'm, I love the little insight you've already given us into some of the Puerto Rican culture and the emphasis on family and connections and yes, one of the things time. that, yeah, as I've been learning, right, the, the Puerto Rican community is super strong, both in Puerto Rico, but then also in the diaspora. So I'm sure we'll touch on, on some of that. More Puerto Ricans actually living outside of Puerto Rico than living in Puerto Rico. So we're a nation yeah. without a nation in a sense. We'll, we'll get into that as we, as we go along. Yeah, and I think that that for folks who are on our programming for a lot of Israel-Palestine related topics too, I think this idea of a nation outside of a nation is one that right. resonates for, for a lot of the, the groups we work with. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I, I want to spend most of our time talking about the present context, but I did for other folks like me who didn't know a whole lot about Puerto Rico before this topic was announced. I wanted to give just a 30 second overview. Um, before colonization, what's now called Puerto Rico was home to the Taino indigenous people. When Spain colonized the islands in 1493, the emphasis on agricultural exports increased and like with much of the Caribbean, enslaved people were trafficked into Puerto Rico to work the land. Mm -hmm. In the late 1900s, the desire for Puerto Rican independence from Spain boiled over into a small rebellion. Um, while it was suppressed, there was movement towards more of a indigenous self-governments, mm -hmm. um, but that didn't last long. For those of you familiar with the Spanish-American War, I was not until a couple weeks ago. Um, the Spanish-American War ended in 1898, 
Puerto Rico and Guam were ceded to the U.S. from Spain as part of the Treaty of Paris, and it established the provincial status of Puerto Rico that it's still under today. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. We don't necessarily have time to get into all of the legal implications, but one of the things, like I mentioned at the beginning, Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens. They have U.S. passports. Um, they don't have representation in Congress, and they can't vote in presidential elections. So there's definitely a, a colonial relationship there that we'll unpack. But today, uh, there's just over 3 million people living in Puerto Rico, as Carlos mentioned, a much bigger community outside of that. Um, and as we've already heard, a really strong social fabric and cultural identity. So just wanted to give us that context as we dive into oh, the colonial relationship today. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to start, because in, in all the reading I was doing and in a lot of the conversations, a lot of it points back to the Jones Act. So I wanted to start there to make sure that when we're talking, I know, <laughs> when we're talking Jones about Act. a lot of the implications, uh, everyone on the call understands what that is and the impact that it has, because a lot of the other topics and themes we'll be talking about comes from that. So starting us off on a super cheery topic, what is the Jones Act and, and, and what impact does it have in Puerto Rico? So... I think the the time the Jones Act had his moment in the sun was post Hurricane Maria about six years ago this week, um, when Hurricane Maria basically destroyed the island of Puerto Rico. Post the hurricane, um, President Trump at that time stopped the Jones Act for a week. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we need it to be stopped forever. The Jones Act is basically, we call it in Puerto Rico, the Jones tax, because anything that comes to a port of Puerto Rico has to first stop at a port in the United States, which is usually Miami, Fort Lauderdale. So for example, buying a Honda Civic 1998, if you're buying it in Puerto Rico, it first needs to stop in an American port to then get here to Puerto Rico. So you're paying almost 48% more for vehicles here just because there's a tax imposed on that item when it stops in an American port. So that's the simplest way to explain <clears throat> All the goods coming to Puerto Rico um, have that extra weight of expense of dollars of money that is going back to the American um, American Treasury. Um, we, of course, as an American territory, do receive federal funding from FEMA, for example, from the Department of Education for our local schools. But if you actually measure what is taken out of Puerto Rico through the Jones Act compared to what is given to Puerto Rico through the different agencies, it's not even close. Um, and so we suffer from incredibly high um, expense on items. Anything you buy in Puerto Rico, it's either going to be um, 20, 30, even 40 to 50 percent more expensive just because of a regulation that's 100 years plus old that literally is just there to make money for the mainland and not for our land. Is that a simple way to explain it and is that fair? That was a great explanation and one of the okay. articles I'll send out goes into it in more detail um, but what, one of the takeaways that I had from it was this idea of like the need for political will and I'm sorry if it's a little bit loud in the background here um, but right one of the things we talk about in Israel-Palestine too is like Congress doesn't move unless there's political will and political pressure mm. and so like you said 100 year old outdated legislation um, that dramatically affects folks who don't have representation in Congress and don't have someone lobbying there for their interests. So that's just a theme I want us to keep in mind as we talk about some of these other issues. Well, there was a there was a war that you guys know about. And one of the big statements that drew the war was that statement, taxation without representation. I think it was like an important thing in American history. Well, here we are as an American territory, myself with an American passport. I am taxed and yet not represented in any shape or form in American politics. As someone who currently lives in DC, I, I empathize and it's on all our license plate, right? And tax and taxation right. without representation. So I think it's a theme that I yeah. feel across cross community solidarity there. Good, good. But I wanted to say before we move on from that, are there any stories in your community that you want to share that highlight the impact of this? I know sometimes when we talk about legislation, it's really easy to stay on the theoretical level or talk about it on a like gross scale. Are there yeah. any stories that you want to share that you think help show exactly how damaging the Jones Act and its implications are for everyday Puerto Rican communities? Well, we'll go back to Hurricane Maria because again, it's 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 a it's a touch point that most people were aware of. The news, right? Uh, the media did touch on Hurricane Maria for a little bit back in 2017 when it happened. Um, and so during Hurricane Maria, uh, a massive destruction, something we haven't seen, and we can get into a climate change conversation then, 
um, but it, the the destruction was massive. It was everywhere. There was not a corner of the island or archipelago, really. We have multiple islands that compose Puerto Rico um, that were severely affected. We have that one week off of the Jones Act. Um, and then President Trump does come to Puerto Rico. And you guys have seen that for us Puerto Ricans, visceral image of him throwing paper towels to a crowd. Um, the reaction, right? The offense that we take at that, um, the kind of blasé, we're, the loss of life, the loss of property, of business, of opportunity, of land. Um, and so we were faced with that, wait a minute, what's our relationship again? Can we kind of, in the midst of this brokenness, in the midst of this destruction, wait, these are the people that are, we're meant to be taken care of by? Or, and the best way for me to personify it, and excuse me if it's emotional or too simplified, but the best way for me to personify this conversation is thinking of an abusive stepfather. And so I'm a child and I'm living in the home of an abusive stepfather. And I can maybe say I'm glad that he at least provides a home and that we have dinner right every night. But he doesn't take care of my mom. He lets me know every day that I'm not really his son, that I don't really belong, that I don't carry his name, that I'm not really his blood. And so that's how it feels. And Hurricane Maria exasperated that reality. Um, I'm of course generalizing and that's not the same for everybody, but it is right now the majority feeling on the island for most Puerto Ricans living here because that oppression of the Jones Act, that oppression of being a second class citizen, that's the only way to explain it. Um, it it's, you know, it's real. And we're now um, struggling with most Puerto Ricans and I'll explain it this way. We have here at the nonprofit 19 employees um, four of them are part of, three of them are part of the ARP program. So they're paid by the ARP foundation to work here, but the rest are employees that we pay, um, that we love, that we hire, that we serve. Um, none of them for three years has been able to move to even rent somewhere better, even though they have a better job than they used to now working here for the nonprofit. None of them have, are even close to being able to purchase a home because between the expenses of the Jones Act, um, the fact that so Jones Act is the beginning. If everything that needs to be imported has an extra tax and the incentive is like, let's import everything. Then there's all these regulations against local manufacturing, against local agri agriculture, because that's a way then to have to force us to buy even more from the outside. Um, and so we feel it on every single level. The food is more expensive. Things that we could harvest here, no problem, because it's lush land. And we are proven here at the nonprofit. We have a seven acre farm that we're growing more and more. It's lush for pineapples and plantains and avocados. And I, I wish I could send you the image of the 55 avocados we picked yesterday that are absolutely huge and lovely and perfect. Most of what we consume, 90% plus of what we consume is imported into the island. Jones Act, the beginning, the foundation for them, all these other levels of oppression and marginalization that keeps us kind of down. So all that to say, post-Hurricane Maria kind of opened our eyes even more to that reality. And I, I can tell you, unfortunately, I can tell you many stories, especially the elderly population, how they're struggling to pay bills, to pay for electrical bills, to pay for their food. And so that's why we exist as a nonprofit to serve them, the most more marginalized communities post-Hurricane Maria being the elderly. Yeah, that's a great example or, or description of the impact this has. Um, I also want to name up front, like we start up here and then we're going to narrow into challenges and then we're going to land in hope and what you okay. all do. So I want to make sure everyone knows, right? We're not just going doom and gloom. We're going to circle back around to Good, good, good. We're called the happy givers, not the sad takers. So we got to exactly. end with some happiness. I am, I am known for bringing the mood down. So we're going to okay. keep people light. Um, but you just described, right, so many of these challenges. And I think understanding the details is important, but also zooming out, like, how would you classify the relationship between Puerto Rico and the U.S.? And I ask this, like, as an American who, granted, like, sure. doesn't know a whole lot about Puerto sure. Rico, has done some research, like, understands it. But I think sometimes language was really important to help us think differently about topics that, you know, we grow up just not really knowing a lot about, maybe intentionally. Um, mm. So how would you classify the relationship between Puerto Rico and the U.S.? Yeah, I I sometimes in different opportunities that I get inside and outside of churches to do public speaking, to share about the work that we do, I, I sometimes, depending on the crowd, like to start by saying it's really hard to be uh, an American colony. It's really difficult um, to be a second class citizen. 
um, both emotionally, economically, in terms of where we're headed. There, there doesn't seem to be, as you were saying before, any conversation about a solution. Um, there's no political will towards it. And I kind of get it. If you're doing the mathematics, it's good business. It's as simple as that. It's capitalism 101. Us being a colony is good business for the U.S. Um, it's a great vacation destination for lovely tourists that come and enjoy our land and and say, it's so great to be in Puerto Rico. They're so happy. Um, we've kind of, I think, for those of you that have watched Ted Lasso, the show Ted Lasso on Apple TV, um, we suffer a little bit from that toxic positivity. Um, sometimes... <laughs> We're so happy and lovely and dance and we really do enjoy life and we really do have a value for joy, joy as resistance, um, joy as a way to survive, but in, in a way that maybe we've been unaware of the reality of things that we can challenge, that we should challenge. And so our relationship with the U.S., we say in Puerto Rico, we are both the biggest and the oldest colony in the world. Um, and that's been since 1898. There's been some adjustments to that reality. Okay, now you're going to be U.S. citizens. You know, we became U.S. citizens right before First World War. So um, the numbers are clear. It's not just that we're American citizens. We're also American soldiers. In the Vietnam War specifically, if you, for those of you who are in D.C., if you walk around the wall for the, the memorial for the Vietnam um, War, uh, you'll see Rivera and Rodriguez as much as you'll see any other last name, because Puerto Rico, if you consider it a state, specifically in the Vietnam War, one of the biggest casualties in the Vietnam War were Puerto Rican soldiers who are American soldiers, right? So imagine going off to war, your life absolutely transformed, maybe a, a specific injury, uh, obviously PTSD that you're bringing back, and then you're moving back to an island where you can't even vote for that who you were meant to call the commander in chief. And so <laughs> I could go on with examples from my family, from our community, where this relationship is, it's, it's not working, it's not fair, it's not just um it, it's a it's a it's a bad equation if you're, you put it on math it's good for somebody and it's not good for us yeah and one of the lenses we use at telos right is that peacemaking requires that we think beyond a zero-sum game and when i look at this situation it is very much one side is winning and the other side is being extracted from so that right, right there tells us how much work needs to be done to bring about any kind of just and peaceful equitable solution resolution change whatever we want to call mm. it on the ground mm -hmm. Um, before we dive into the the important work you do with the happy givers and all of the ways you put what I'm going to call beloved community into action, um, I want us to just focus for one more moment on what the biggest challenges facing Puerto Rico are. You've mentioned a couple, right? The Jones Act makes prices, cost of living almost twice as high as on the U.S. mainland. You mm. mentioned climate change briefly. Just wanted to give you a chance to run through um, what some of the biggest challenges facing Puerto Rico are, either at a collective level or, again, for individual folks, families, communities living there on the ground. Yeah, so we have most of the people that we serve, um, there are some specific SNAP benefits. Um, we call it, how do you say that in English? Um, the 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 card you can use, federal money to go shopping for food. I think um, it's also SNAP. Yeah, so the SNAP and Medicaid. And so you can, you can intentionally go online and say, oh, wait a minute, Puerto Ricans receive all these benefits. But from the Supreme Court down, which something recently happened, uh, a Puerto Rican gentleman who lived in the States who was receiving Social Security when he moved back to Puerto Rico as a Puerto Rican, and this was decided by the Supreme Court just at the beginning of this year, his uh, benefits were came down dramatically while living in a place where there's less income and more expense. Um, and so you can say we have all these we have all this access, but it is limited access. It is conditional access. It is, again, not equitable access. And so we serve a, a, a community that is more than 200 people in our community who are under the poverty line, 60 plus, or an adult with a disability. And so we're constantly faced with that. And, and to go back to your question about the current um, situation, we have a thing called Act 2022, which has also been added, something called Act 60, Puerto Rico is basically a tax haven um, for wealthy foreigners to come to Puerto Rico. Um, you pay like 4% capital gains tax. You don't pay any property tax. Um, you only have to live half of the year here in Puerto Rico. Um, you only have to uh, hire a certain amount of people. So unfortunately, we become a place now where literally thousands of wealthy foreigners have come. 
the idea at the beginning was we've had all this trauma, we've had all this loss, we've had all these hurricanes, we need an influx of cash, people to come and invest. It's unfortunately become a corruption cesspool of people coming to Puerto Rico, buying property that should belong to some of my employees who live here, who love it here. And instead of my one employee being able to buy one house, we got wealthy people coming and buying 10 houses, putting up the market price ridiculously up, and now it's unaccessible to our own people here. And so low income, which is always in the lowest category, if you consider, if you count Puerto Rico as a state, it's always going to be the poorest. It's always going to be the more, the most expensive. Um, it's always going to be the ones with the least amount of federal benefits. And so the conversation is have been had, you know, right now in a very sincere way. Um, the idea is not to leave the U.S. The idea is to join in terms of full rights. Some people, like my family, believe, no, we need full independence. And through independence, we can, you know, draw out those relationships with not just the U.S., but different islands of the Caribbean. Um, because one of the horrible things of colonization has been the Jones Act doesn't just put on that financial burden. It actually keeps us separate from our neighbors. So St. Thomas, I can climb a hill here in my town um, in less than an hour, and I can see St. Thomas on a distance. We can't have any uh, interaction, even though it's its own American territory. And there's all these interactions that we could have with Dominican Republic, which is just west of us, with Haiti and with um, Jamaica, with Cuba. None of those people, none of those islands, none of those countries could have relationship of trade with us. So we're kind of in the eastern most part, most part of the Caribbean, um, kind of feeling isolated. And one of those comments that would come post Hurricane Maria, which is really an excuse, it's hard to get help to Puerto Rico because they're so far away. Yeah, but Dominican Republic is not that far away. St. Thomas, St. Lucia, um, Antigua, they're not that far away, but we couldn't do any kind of trade with them. And so we feel prisoners are not our own paradise. Um, and and it's, just, it's just really unfair. It's really hard to be a colony. It's a great summation. It's really unfair to be a colony, yeah. Um, I want to circle back later to the question of independence, statehood, super important to touch on. But first, I do want to turn to the really important work you and your community are doing. Um, right. And so I'm, I'm going to ask you this question through the lens of beloved community, because to me, it's such an important framework when we think about not just what we want to see, but also how we get there. And so you and your community are putting into practice, right, how you relate to one another, how you relate to the land, how you think about the work you're doing exactly the type of world you want to build towards in the future. And so it's both that practice and that idea for the destination. Mm. So can you tell us more about, you know, your happy project, the happy <laughs> givers, any piece, all of it? Um, I know there's a lot of different facets. Yeah. Uh, I'd love for you to share with us the really important work you're doing on the ground to, to strengthen Puerto Rico communities. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I think it's really good um, especially in the church world, it's really good that this is a local organization led by local people. And there's no doubt we have, I have a farmer who's from the States. Um, one of the girls, one of the ladies that helps me lead the, uh, the teams that come from short-term teams is an American, but the work is mainly um, led by Puerto Ricans. Of course, I'm a Puerto Rican, born and raised here. I love Puerto Rico. And so we are a local organization doing work on the local ground, empowering local leaders, hiring local people. Um, and so we have a number of different projects. We have a social kitchen because when you're leading a nonprofit, there's this uncomfortable tension between relief, which is like people are hungry. We need to feed them now. And also development. How can I make sure that 30 years down the line, they're not still hungry, right? How do you do the moment, the hope for right now, they're hungry, we need to feed them. And how do we create a system where we're teaching and we're learning from each other about how to create sustainable ways to be fed together? And so that's why we have a social kitchen. I have social workers on staff. Their main job is we're in marginalized communities. Who are the most marginalized people inside of marginalized communities? Um, so we're literally like looking, who are the people in, in this context that are in the most need? We keep finding elderly people living by themselves. Um, in homes without water, electricity, um, in homes where there's a lot of hoarding and there's uh, all sorts of diseases. And so we've been focusing on that's how we do relief work. The moment we need to we need to solve this problem now. And yet at the same time, we don't want to be consumed by the solving of the problem now. What do we do about making sure that this doesn't happen to their children and their grandchildren? 
And so we are full of hope and joy. And that's why we're farming. Farming doesn't make sense if you're just trying to do a short-term mission trips and here are the saviors that come and here are the photos that we're taking and here's on Facebook and we're literally fundraising more to pay for us going on the trip than actually fundraising for the work that's being done on the ground. It's just an insane system, but that's how it goes. So we're trying to like, how do we rewrite that story? Um, how do we actually do local work, local work that matters where we're listening to the local leaders and then they're, they're the ones saying, it's too expensive to eat healthy. I'm diabetic. I got hypertension. Our town of Vega Baja, the Washington Post was actually here a couple of weeks ago doing a report on how our town of Vega Baja, second place in the whole world for renal failure. So what's up with our diet? What's up with our medical services? What is happening that we're losing so many of the doctors? I don't blame them. They're moving to the States because they got an American passport. They can't vote here. They don't make good money here. I don't blame them for moving to Connecticut and dealing with that winter, but at least they're going to make good money and they can travel and see their mama during Christmas. I don't blame them for leaving, but I got so many elderly people with zero access to medication, to doctors, to services while having a horrible diet. Because if you're at the if you're at the supermarket and all you can afford is Ritz biscuits and cheese whiz to put on it, what are you going to do? Go hungry? Or so that becomes their diet. And so we are very intentional about cooking good, lovely, healthy meals that are very Puerto Rican while also farming at our community farm. So we have a farm that's growing. Um, we do a lot of the African roots, which is really part of our history. Um, we do a lot of plantains and avocados. We're now growing a lot of lettuce and kale and all sorts of nice green goodies. Um, a lot of acerola, which is the Caribbean cherry, um, all that to feed our people the best. So how do you do the relief work without being handouts? Then how, while you're doing the relief work, build a world where the happy givers is not needed. That's the dream in 30 years where we don't have to exist because the community is doing its work, where we've challenged the government to do their work, um, where we've challenged right community leaders and local government and different agencies and all these different corporations that are around here taking up our resources. How do we become, how do we become unneeded in our community? That would be the dream in 30 years. So we're trying to set up a community kitchen and community gardens, creating jobs left, right, and center, center in order for the community to be lifted in a way. And yet I say all that, which is very hopeful, but unless we solve this colonial status, it's not gonna happen. So that's the impossible tension that we live in. What you just laid out to me perfectly encapsulate what the goal of any NGO should be, right? We're trying to do ourselves out of a job. We want the, yes. the problem that led to our creation to cease to exist, so that we don't have to do this work anymore and we can do other work. So that was a, a that fantastic was description of that tension. Um, want to ask a follow-up question specifically about relationships to the land, in part because your description of the avocados you harvested, oh, that sounds amazing to me. I can't yes. get this picture well, out of my I feel so sad for you guys, paying like $3 for the little has things that like the seed is this big and the avocado is this big. It's just sad. Yes. Sad. No, this is, I don't live in paradise. Good. Absolutely. Take your time. Thank you. I'm good. Um, yeah. So just wanted to ask because, right, community comes from a, a very rooted place and the land matters. Mm -hmm. um, can you share a little Pretty bit more either about sustainable farming practices, community self-reliance as it relates to the land or how Puerto Rican culture is connected to the land? Um, in a way that then my next question is going to be about the, the diaspora community, but I want to give you one more chance to talk about the importance of um, yeah. land and, and connecting folks back to where they come from. I love it. I love it. Um, I, so that's my experience. I, I love my Mac and my phone and my TikTok and my AC on. <laughs> and yet I've discovered this incredible joy of being on the ground, of getting my hands in the dirt of planting a seed that literally becomes a meal that I can deliver and have with another member of my community. I, I without sounding overly dramatic, which I tend to do as a Puerto Rican, it, there, there's nothing better than literally like seed to fruit, to harvest, to cooking, to eating, um, and to sharing with somebody else. It's in, an incredible joy. 
And we're just, the beautiful thing is we as a team, we're discovering it together. So from the social worker to our print people, we have, so we have a, an online store called thehappygivers.com. So we brought all that work here. We print and we ship out of here. Of course, we have the social workers. We got the farming team. We got the cooking team, but we take days during the week and we're all farming. Um, and we intentionally bring the older people um, who come from a farming community. This is um, sugarcane um, community and pineapple community. And they haven't been in touch with the ground. And we there's literally like now all this beautiful science about agrotherapy and the elderly coming and reconnecting with the ground and doing it with their grandchildren and sharing the things that they've learned from their grandparents and the and, and the beautiful hope and, and joy that's created in that simple exchange of these like beautiful truths. And so we are we're loving farming. The the land is telling us that she loves us for farming because it's lush and one of the great things about being in the Caribbean is like, we don't have to be like you guys and like, we got a harvest in October because the winter is coming. There's none of that here. We got, we got summer all year long. We got different harvests all year long. We got 27 of our produce that can be farmed, harvested at any point of the year, no matter what, when you start it. Um, and so it's so wonderful um, to both do it, do it ourselves, learn the joy for ourselves, then invite the community to do it with us. We got all these wonderful local farmers that are now full of hope. Like, I love what you guys are doing with the farm. I started doing my little farm. We're exchanging seeds. Like, here's my plantain seed. Oh, it gave me the best plantains. Here you go, have three. And it's just, it's an incredible exchange of ideas, of hope, um, of vision of like, wait a minute, if it's working here, maybe my land could be. And so we, we are loving that exchange and we're loving what the ground has given us. And it's been, you know, if you think of the land, um, our Taino Indians, which you mentioned them at the beginning, um, the, the, the native people of Puerto Rico, the Taino people, there were two, uh, the, the Caribe people, why we're called the Caribbean, they used to be more in the Western Caribbean, and the Taino people from the Eastern Caribbean, and they barely had agriculture, because the land was so lush, and there's all this cassava everywhere, and there's all these fruits, they would do fishing, but outside of that, they didn't have all these great systems of agriculture. They played games and invented hammocks and would fish and have an amazing tan all year long because it's just like, that's what the land was. It was created and formed to be lush, to be generous, to be giving um, for us to receive from it and for us to give back to it. So we absolutely love it. And myself, right, as a, as a, as a Christian man who was a pastor for more than 18 years, rediscovering the joy of creation of that gift of creation of the of things that i would preach about of you know sowing and reaping and i would use it as a way to manipulate people into giving a bigger offering the actual reality of like sowing and reaping and that turning into a legitimate gift that we can share with one another i could go on all day and i can't wait for you guys to come visit and i can't wait to make you sweat out there for seven hours in the sun uh, my my lovely migrant workers, I'm going to receive you and put you to work, and it's going to be wonderful. Uh, it really is an amazing joy that we love to share with other people. I love all of your descriptions, Carlos, about about what this looks like in community, and also the element of hope. Um, yes. What came up for me during this? So I, I grew up Lutheran, and Martin Luther is incredibly problematic for so many reasons. But one <laughs> of the stories that really stuck with me that came up as you were talking about this, like mm. the, the depth that planting a tree or investing in farming and agriculture means in terms of hope for tomorrow. Oh. So when Martin Luther was asked what he would do if the world would end tomorrow, he answered, I would plant a tree today. Yes. And I think similarly, right, in the face of climate change, in the face of rising costs and, and people leaving or all of those healthcare professionals leaving, as you described, right, one is what is the most tangible form of hope? It's it's planting in the ground, it's investing in, right, that crop cycle, that belief that tomorrow will come, yes. there will be an abundant harvest, right? We're, we're feeding our community tomorrow, today, and the actions we take. So there's so much, so much there that really, like, spoke yeah. to me. And I, I am very inspired by that kind of visual of how this actually looks. It's not just theoretical, it's not just on paper, it's not just person to person, but it's really rooted. And listen, it's, you know, we tell people, this is not like we spend hours in front of a whiteboard, kind of pretending like we know what sustainability looks like and how do we do permaculture. This is survival for us. Mm -hmm. Having to put solar panels and relying on the sun, it's an amazing concept. It's our birthright is sunshine, but it's not because like we're clever. It's like the grid is trash. 
Um, it's a it's a foreign company that doesn't care about the local people. It's a monopoly that we pay the highest energy cost. Again, if you consider as one of the states, we pay the higher energy cost with the absolute worst services. I, I'm surprised it's happened so many times. I was with Bernice King, the daughter of Martin Luther King, on one of these calls on a live event. Boom, electricity has gone. And there I am without electricity. <laughs> right. That, it's common for that to happen consistently. And when you come from a marginalized community, it's even worse because then you lose the medicines that were in your fridge and there's all these, the ripple effects of it. And so we didn't put solar panels because it's kind of clever and it's kind of modern, it's kind of cute. That's how we survive here. That's how we endure. We're not doing permaculture and farming just because, oh, this would be nice photos for people to give more money. If we don't do it, we can't afford the fruit and the vegetables that we know our community needs. And so there's an element of hope that it's like, is this hope? Is this survival? Is this the fight? I think it's a bit of everything because this is how we survive and this is how we push through. And if we didn't have hope, then we would just be miserable and, and, and not have any kind of desire to push through. We would just leave. But it's worth fighting. It's worth staying. It's a beautiful land full of beautiful people. And we're here to, you know, to see it through. Absolutely. I want to ask a little bit about the relationship between the folks who are still physically present in Puerto Rico and the folks who have left, whether out of economic necessity, yeah. desire to move right, generations increase, not putting blame or shame on anyone who has left. Sure. Can you tell us more about the relationship between Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico and the, the Puerto Rican diaspora community. As you said, right, there's more Puerto Ricans who live outside of Puerto Rico than in Puerto Rico. What does that relationship look like? What are some of the good parts? What are some of the tensions? Um, yeah. Enlighten well, us. Uh, as somebody who has, I, I did two years in Lakeland, Florida. That's my English is from Lakeland, Florida and from that show Saved by the Bell when I was 10. That's how I learned English. Um, and then I did two years in, in Florida. Then my parents got back together. That's why he had, we had moved. I moved with my mom and my grandparents. But then my parents got back together, moved back to Puerto Rico. Then I did almost four years in Toronto, Canada. Uh, that's where I met my wife from Sheffield, England. I learned how to listen to different English accents that made no sense. And I, you know, I, I can understand a German speaking English as much as I can understand somebody from West Virginia speaking English. And so I have good ears for the English because I spent, you know, in Toronto learning. And then I did 10 years in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and what I used to call the buckle of the Bible Belt, right? It was kind of like the end of the Bible Belt. And I think it's staying more than anywhere else. And so we did 10 years of pastoring in Raleigh, North Carolina, not a Latino church, but actually a, a, an Anglo uh, church that um, unfortunately we've learned a few lessons, some very painful ones while we were pastoring there. And so I understand being a Puerto Rican who loves Puerto Rico, who's not living in Puerto Rico. I get the, the pool. I get the desire to come back. I get getting used to not being here. And I'll tell you a story. When I moved back to Puerto Rico after my 10 years in Raleigh, I would get so frustrated because there's these two cars on this two on this one road that has only two small la lanes and they'll just stop in the middle of the road and start talking to each other while I'm in the back, just waiting for them to move. I got important things to do. You know, I got to get to places on time. And so after 10 years in Raleigh, I come to Puerto Rico and I had completely forgotten that them talking is more important than anything else I have to do. That whenever I go to the hardware store and I'm in line waiting to pay, and the owner of the hardware store is talking to the customer that's in front of me. They're going to chat about their families. They're going to talk about that project that he started five years ago that he's still working on. And they have to take their time because legitimately and culturally, it is more important to be in relationship with one another. It took me a while to relearn that it actually matters most, right? To connect with another human being, to actually look at them, to say hi, to engage. And I've just kind of fallen in love once again with the fact that I can just be at the gas station and somebody drives by, and I'm telling you, cause it just happened like five minutes before getting on this phone call. I was flying from the gas station here and some truck drove by with this crazy music. And there was a lady next to me putting gas and we looked at each other, started laughing. We started talking and it's like, we had a two minute conversation, like the most normal thing. And so there's this beautiful interaction between other humans. And so if I'm thinking about the diaspora, like I said before, I get it why they've gone. I don't blame anybody for leaving. It is legitimately hard to live here. And they're making three times, sometimes four times the money. If they're bilingual, maybe even more than that, um, they get to come back, right? Because it's easier than traveling to a foreign nation in terms of like immigration and all the documents, right? You, you're just, it's like you're taking a plane to Florida from California. It's the same. 
Um, you don't have to go through, you know, customs or whatever. And so I get it why they're gone. But the unfortunate reality is that we are now faced with a very aging elderly population because in the last 10 years, 12.7% of Puerto Ricans that were living in Puerto Rico have left Puerto Rico. So we're talking 100,000 plus people. And of those 12.7% of our population that has left, more than 80% of that is zero to 40 years old. So we've lost young people, people with degrees, doctors and lawyers and tradesmen in, for construction. They've gone to the States looking for a better life. Their grandparents here, which is a lot of the people that we serve, are like, I didn't pay that because you go over there, you'll be fine. You go and travel and see the world, make more money. I'll be fine over here. And they're not fine. And they've and they've the increase of cost and inflation and everything else that we've been talking about, the Jones Act, everything's getting worse. If it's much harder now. Again, not just the Jones Act, but the fact that so many doctors have left, there's you have if you if you need to see a cardiologist and you make an appointment today, it's going to be for like March or April of next year. And and in terms of the talent that has left, the best talent has left. Right. And so we are uh, in a, a critical situation. Our medical services are in a critical, critical situation. Um, food services. Again, the prices of everything is so ridiculously expensive. And so the diaspora, nobody blames them. But man, we miss them. And man, we miss that talent. And it's, you know, I have, we have as an organization, a lot of supporters who are Puerto Ricans that have left and they have some level of guilt. And they're like, we want to give to the happy givers. We want to be involved. Every time they travel back to Puerto Rico, they come and they spend a day serving with here. The amount of diaspora people that come to visit us and to give us a day of their service. But the reality is it's brutal. The, the drain of talent has actually cost lives. And that's not a dramatic thing. This is what's happening specifically with our medical services. And in any, any trade that you would need, um, the talent is just not here as it used to be. And hopefully we're building something beautiful that in, in some shape or form can entice people to come back. And yet I say all that, and then we're struggling through some of the worst storms we've ever seen. Hurricane Fiona, which was one year ago yesterday, was the most rain that Puerto Rico has ever seen in the history books. Um, we just had the hottest August we've ever had in all our history books. So we are at the forefront of climate change and the data, the data is clear, Puerto Rico, um, as a, a, if you call it a nation, a territory, as a people here on the island, we've suffered the most from climate change in terms of loss of life, property, um, and opportunity in the last 10 years. So we are at the forefront of what now it's becoming more and more of a conversation around the world, more, there's, I, I'm kind of sensing there's less like, is it real? Is it not? It's kind of like, okay, I guess it is real. It's been really real for us for 10 years. It's been really brutal. There are beaches here in the town of Vega Baja that I used to go. I'm not that old. I got some white hairs, but I'm not that old that I used to go to. They don't exist anymore. The ocean has completely come. I have. We have photos. We have those old video cameras. My dad loved that video camera you would put with the whole cassette here. We have videos of us at local beaches that don't exist anymore. That's our reality. And so I don't, I, talking about the diaspora, I don't blame anybody for leaving, hopefully we can get some of those people back and hopefully the world will respond sooner rather than later to this climate crisis. Yeah, everything you've just laid out really to me illustrates how untenable the current situation is, right? And and it yeah. cannot continue forever. It um cannot. It for, cannot. for unsustainable. All of the reasons you've just laid out. So I want to make sure we get to our audience's questions as well, but I want to ask Absolutely. one more that maybe combines three into one. Um but when people talk about change right oftentimes the question is well yeah the current situation is is unsustainable what what else could there be what could there be and when mm -hmm. i was doing some reading on this to prepare it sounds like as you mentioned right some folks are for independence some folks are for statehood i'm sure yeah. there are other folks who have a, a myriad of different ideas yeah. but I'm wondering if and i'm going to wrap this into the other question i had um for you as a puerto rican how has your relationship to the U.S. changed over time? And how does that fit into your understanding of what the best future for Puerto Rico is? And how does that fit into your understanding of what other opportunities are for Puerto Rico's oh. future that you might not support? Yeah, you see, that's a lovely question because that's what we don't have right now is the opportunities for Puerto Rican to determine what Puerto Ricans want in Puerto Rico. It's as simple as that. Um, and so 
I, I, I have my opinions about what I want to happen in the future, um, our status as a state or keep it as it is, but in a new way or actually become fully independent through a process that would be, you know, regulated and, and lovely and hopeful and whatever. Um, but the truth is that we don't we don't even have a voice. The only way Puerto Rican status can be solved is by an act of Congress. And there's zero conversation in Congress about there being any act in any sort of direction. We've had multiple referendums. Sometimes the statehood party wins. Sometimes the let's leave it as it is wins. Sometimes the independence movement is doing better than other times. But it means nothing because it's local elections that have no say, as you said, as you clearly said, we have no representation in Congress. We don't have a voice in the Senate, in the House that would say, hey, this is what the Puerto Rican people said. I'm going to do a thing and we're going to have a commission. None of that is happening. And, and, and it doesn't even seem to be even close to being part of the conversation. And we're clear in Puerto Rico, we're not the only ones, right? We talk about Guam and American Samoa. There are other American colonies in the American empire. And we need to find solutions to how we move forward outside of this relationship that does not work for local people. And, and sometimes we can have a conversation about, well, we can become a state and there could be hopeful conversations about we would have full rights and there'd be a different relationship. Now we have representation in Congress. It's becoming less and less attractive as you see what's happening in Hawaii. Uh, it's an island off the coast over there in the Pacific, but they have this strenuous relationship where the local people, if you talk to the investors that have made good money in Hawaii, they're, they're of course, are very happy that it's a state. But if you talk to local Hawaiians who are part of the kingdom of Hawaii, they're not as excited yet about the, what they've received becoming a state. So it's a convoluted conversation. Um, it's a frustrating conversation. And unfortunately, it feels like a conversation that has no solution currently because there's no political will in either direction. And the worst part of the conversation is that we can't be part of the conversation. So any opportunity that any Puerto Rican has to even to an audience like you guys to be able to just start a conversation, whether you agree with me or not, at least we're talking at least is something. Well, and that, that to me, Carlos, circles right where do I wanted us to end before we open up the conversation is if we look through the principles and practices, what we've spent time today doing is listening to understand not just your perspective, but the perspective of, of Puerto Rico. You can only speak for yourself. And also you've brought up a lot of themes that I think are really important that we haven't necessarily all heard before. Sure. Um, we're centering the voices of the marginalized. And in this context, I just mean that those closest to the problem have the greatest insights for the solutions. And hopefully after this call, right, I invite all of my fellow Americans to self-interrogate. What about this were you ignorant of? Um, maybe all of it, maybe none of it. I think we've all heard over the past few years, especially with some of the recent hurricanes, a little bit more about some of this. Um, but it's a chance to really think more about why we don't know what we know and, and how to learn what we need to know. But then with self-interrogation comes advocacy, right? We, we do that so we can better advocate. So I want to land us before I open the conversation up, Carlos, with what do you wish we would do on this call today or after this call today to advocate for everything that you just described? Um, now that we understand that for those of us who are Americans, we are implicated in, in this colonial project. Wow, that's a phenomenal question. Um, and there's no doubt that, even, again, just having the conversation is a step forward where this wouldn't even be a conversation, right? I, like I said before, I went to school in the States and there's 0% of conversation of Puerto Rico in any history book. Um, and so even you guys being aware of the Spanish America war of the Jones act, uh, it's just hopeful. And is you know, it's an invitation then, okay, let's go deeper into how this can be solved. But the truth is if my American brothers and sisters don't deal with their Congress, um, there's, <laughs> Right now, as is established, like I said before, the solution for a colonial status is an act of Congress. So there's no doubt that um, listening to Puerto Rican voices who are in the states, um, there are Puerto Ricans, right, who are in American politics because they're maybe residents of Illinois, residents of Florida, and they've got involved in American politics. And again, they have different opinions about what should happen in the future. Um, but learning, listening, being engaged, asking questions. I, 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 I mean, I don't have to guess. I can imagine that most people that, uh, that are here on this call in some shape or form have some Puerto Rican connection outside of me, Carlos. Um, somebody that they know, somebody that they dated back in the past, somebody that they you know, have gone to church with, um, that's a Puerto Rican. Uh, and so actually engaging those people in this conversation, intentionally reaching out to them and saying, hey, I've been learning about this. Can you tell me your perspective? They might sound very different to mine, 
but you've done the same thing. You've given them the same gift you gave me, which is the opportunity to tell our story. And so that's at the base level, that's at the individual level, obviously as organizations, and this is where my heart is with Telos, as I did the, the trip to Palestine and as I was learning their story and I, I kept asking forgiveness during the trip because I kept saying, I'm sorry that I'm relating all this that I'm seeing to my story, but it's just so similar, settler colonialism, like I feel like I'm home when I was on the Western side, that like I'm home here and I understand that. And even the way that they frame and they design this part of the city, makes sense to me in terms of how you build a colony and how you oppress people and how you separate people even in their own land and so you know coming to puerto rico and visiting puerto rico not as a consumer but as one who is joining our story because we love hospitality like you guys uh, I, I love having people over. I love inviting people. Um, I love people hearing our story. I love people. I love it when people come to Puerto Rico and they make that mm noise when they're eating our food. I love it when they go to the beach and they have a mojito on their hands and they're just like, oh, this is the life. I can't believe you live here. I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. I live in paradise. I live with the most loving, gorgeous, hungry, love, hungry for justice people that I've known. Our team couldn't be more wonderful, more willing to fight for what is right, and yet at the same time, more full of joy. I absolutely love living here. As hard as it is, I love living here. I love being part of this community. And you guys coming in that heart of, how can I come? How can I join? How can I serve? You take off that white savior hat and you put on the, let's serve, let's joy, let's join into what's happening. Um, and then there's something really powerful about having this conversation we're having not on Zoom, but around our table and while we're farming together and while we're surfing together, that's, there's a whole other level of understanding, right? And you guys know this better than anybody else, the power of just being present and what proximity can do to transform somebody's heart, somebody with influence that then can influence, you know, uh, at higher levels of power. I've got about six more questions, thoughts and comments that came out of what you just said, but I do want to open it up to everyone else now. We've got a, a few Please. minutes left. Um, I'm just going to open it up. Um, Carlos, thank you so much for everything you just shared. Again, there's so much more we can dive into, but I want to make sure we do have a chance for other folks to sure. um, ask their questions. So feel free to just unmute. We're a small enough group that um, don't worry about raising your hand. Just jump right in. I'll jump right in. Um, when you're talking about a you know, the natural re resources in Puerto Rico being exploited, and you mentioned corporations, do you find that it's generally more sort of the U.S. government ex ex exploiting those resources or private corporations that are U.S. based, or are they sort of yeah. around other countries too? Great question. It's it's both and, and I'll, and I'll explain. There was a thing, there was a law called the 936 back in the 90s. Clinton, I think, was the one that shut it off. And it was basically, oh, we want manufacture in America, pharmaceutical in America, but it's expensive to do it in America, but we can do it in quote unquote America. Let's do it in Puerto Rico because the, um, the hourly salary is lower in Puerto Rico and they have less regulations and we can uh, skim around the regulations of where we do those pharmaceuticals. If you drive two minutes down the road this way, you get to where 90% of the world's Viagra is done. It's two minutes down the road here. It's one of the biggest Pfizer plants in the world, two minutes down the road. Um, and so very low regulation, right? They can say it's a manic, it's American pharmaceuticals. We're in America, but they're using Puerto Rican employees. Whenever the laws change it, oh, you made it hard. We're just going to move. We're going to leave. And so, right, that's a private corporation using the hand of the government to lower regulations to kind of cheat the system, which is why it's happening with individuals now. What I was talking about, Act 2022, is basically similar to um, Act 936 for pharmaceuticals. Now it's individuals doing the same thing. Hey, how can I cheat the American system as an American who is wealthy here in, quote unquote, an American territory? And I'm still living in the U.S., but I'm taking advantage of all these you know, of the people, of the land, of the property, of the taxes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So unfortunately, it's both in. I can jump in with a question, Carlos. This is so, so good. Thank you for all that you're sharing with us and the vision that you're offering of, of what it would look like for us to support the, all the beauty of your home to flourish and, and be seen. 
And I'm curious to know from your perspective of also having, you know, worked in the church for many years and within, you know, uh, the continental U.S., um, where you might see a particular role for the church in this work of, you know, um, providing justice for Puerto Ricans. Um, and that can be both, you know, specifically on how they can engage, but also what it will take for from a cultural transformation perspective within Christianity in the U.S. to, to engage differently, not only on Puerto Rico, but on other issues of, of justice, um, broadly speaking. Man, uh just need to sort out that manifest destiny theology because basically it started with the indigenous people in the States and it's going on with Puerto Rico. It's basically, this is ours. It belongs to us. It should belong to us. We are the godly people called by God, blessed by God. And so just starting, just starting with some good, healthy theology with if within the American church um, about service, about loving, about preferring the other. To me, it's always been insane as a Puerto Rican to hear America call itself a Christian nation. And I'd be like, so if you take the context of a human Christian and what Jesus Christ asked a Christian to do, so America should love Mexico as much as it loves itself, right? If you say Christian nation and then you say America, uh, shouldn't America want Iran to do to itself what it wants Iran to do to it? You know, couldn't you use the American, uh, the Christian ethics and just turn them into and I know that sounds almost silly to say, but it's it starts with really terrible theology um, outside of the context of Jesus and using scripture as a way to see America as Israel, as the you know, a biblical Israel, as opposed to seeing it sometimes as Babylon. That's how we see it. Um, it's this empire that's consuming us, this, this dragon that's eating us um, and then trying to make us feel bad if we complain and then trying to make us feel guilty if we're not grateful. And so, you know, that's kind of the for the church to correct its theology in the context of how it sees America as a nation in the context of other people. Um, and then of course, I can say that, and yet at the same time, David, as an organization, we welcome, sometimes the most conservative churches send us the biggest teams with the most amount of money, because they have this, they have they do have that theology of the short term missions trips. What am I gonna do? Because the older person could not care less if their theology is right or wrong, they just need food. They need a roof that's fixed. They need water that's running. And, and then, and so we live in that tension. Again, how do we correct this for the next generation? And yet at the same time, we got to work with what we got. Um, I, I was sharing a post recently about the fact that we still serve our lunches on those horrible styrofoam plates. Um, we're kind of stuck with them because the other eco-friendly options that we would love to use because we have the right theology, right? In terms of taking care of creation, we can't use them because they're too expensive. And so I'm fully aware of that. Like, how do we correct this theology that's so destructive, that has been so destructive? Why it's such a crazy thing that American history is trying to be controlled in terms of what the truth is of our past. Um, we need to face the terrible atrocities that America as a nation has done. And yet at the same time, you know, there is forward movement and we need to have hope that there is a generation that's changing, that there is, you know, it is coming. Um, unfortunately for the oppressed and the marginalized, it can't come soon enough. And so I, I would hope that the church would kind of awaken to that invitation as clearly from Christ to be servants and that it would then translate that into me as an American Christian inside of this very privileged evangelical church, for example, how can I then assume that the cloak of humility, according to Philippians 2, and serve in Puerto Rico in a way that's not like a colonial servant, but like an actual uh, ally, that would be so helpful. Carlos, there are so many themes. I wish we had six more hours to pick up on. Could have asked each of these questions individually and had a whole discussion around it. Um, but I want to be respectful of your time. I want to make sure we get you back out to your avocado tree so you can go do the work we're talking Wedding about. here, guys. I keep putting the AC up and yep. like, is that enough? <laughs> um, but just want to say a, a huge and heartfelt thank you for spending the time with us today. Um, uh -huh. I know for all of us, we're we're figuring out what it looks like to advocate, to act on what we've learned, to take that step from education and learning towards action. Um, and you're, you today were a huge part of understanding more, not just about what we now know, but I think the gaps of what we need to keep learning about and researching and leaning into. Um, so thank you so much for your time with us today, all the work you do, and for being willing to share about it. A huge thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. And of course, anytime um, I can 
I can give a voice to our story. I, I, I love the opportunity. Um, and you, I love Telos. I love what you guys are doing. It's a joy to be, I consider myself now part of the Telos family. So thank you for having me, for making room for me, for our story. And hopefully we'll see you here. Let's have this conversation right here. Much better. Great call Much to better. action. Great call to action. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Carlos, you're welcome to hop off. I want to be respectful of your time. Everyone Thank else is also ready to hop off. Um, or we will keep the Zoom open for 15, 20 minutes so we can process what we just learned. I know it's a lot. And so I want to have some non-recorded space for our community to talk about this. So I'm going to so, stop the recording here.